Well, my parents, uh, born in New York City, so dad is from uh, Forest Hills in Queens, and my mother was born in Fort Greene in Brooklyn. Oh. So I've been a New Yorker, like I guess third generation New Yorker, more or less. Yeah, that's my central base. And uh, I, but they had me in New Jersey. Uh, I guess there was a moment where this city just, just went to hell. And uh, they moved out to a suburb and they stayed there for a couple of years and then moved back into New York later. So there was a, a small moment of uh, going across the border into that other state. <laughs> and then, uh, and I, I, don't, I don't remember much. Yeah. And then uh, been here for most of uh, my life off and on. You know, um, I, I, have, uh, I have a house in uh, Germany uh, hmm. near Lake of Constance. And I spent some time in places like Toronto and lived in Cambridge for a long time. So, but New York City is the home base. Interesting. It's, it's, it's uh, even my time in Los Angeles. It's just, once you know this place, it's, uh, you can, you can make it anywhere, just like the song. <laughs> and and uh, I, you get really, um, you have that kind of attitude, uh, which is, I, I don't know, it's changed over the years, especially after the pandemic, but uh, just the expectation of uh, excellence or meeting like the most phenomenal people or the weirdest people or both, like that seems to be the New York thing on a constant basis at a, you know, a, you know I guess, I guess the densest possible area for people who are brilliant. That doesn't mean there aren't brilliant people all over the plate, all over the world. Yeah. It's, here it's like that. So it keeps me around because it's just people constantly, they cycle through. Yeah, for sure. Satellite. Yeah. And myself included. So it's every time I seem to go away from New York, it's, it's gravity. It draws uh, you back. <laughs> yeah. It draws me back. And, yeah. and uh, I love it here. Um, so I'm going to pick it up, but your mic is hitting the, the zipper quite a bit. And I just want to make sure that we don't, listeners don't get you know yeah, maybe do i need the headphones for or yeah it's pretty helpful because otherwise the when we go through speakers like the zoom cuts out us when you're talking we get this weird kind of silence part i'm wondering if you oh, put I... it in in your jacket instead of out of the jacket maybe oh you, you mean like tuck it so it doesn't yeah. uh well you know i could also tape it to the side with that or that would look odd you could do that uh, or actually if you open your jacket up a little bit maybe the zipper will be further out if that makes sense oh that should work that? yeah yeah that should work yeah, it looks more rock star too. Is it my bumping? Yeah. If you okay. move a lot, it's a maybe, but I think you'll be okay. <laughs> it's so hard to, <laughs> to not move. And talk. Uh, yeah. um, um, so uh, that's interesting. Uh, so you're like one of the rare. New I was gonna say that you're New like Yorkers a rare species who's actually from New York, uh, but you don't have an accent. Well, sure. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, I speak two languages, uh, English and bad English. So <laughs> usually here, trying to avoid that. But uh, absolutely, I mean, you know, the, the New York accents, I mean, even many parts of America, it sort of just you know, sort of disappeared. Um, mm -hmm. And even with my kids, uh, they did start picking it up. I wasn't happy with that. They were going to uh, <laughs> school. And they just... They just were not sounding right. And uh, <laughs> I was sort of worried about that because um, people do tend to judge you by your accent. Sure. And I, I never intentionally undid an accent. I mean, this is just how I've always spoken. Mm. But um, yeah, I guess I'm glad I don't have it, uh, you know, but I, I could get into it more or less, but it, it wouldn't be real. No, I'm not, interesting. not much of an actor. It yeah. depends on who you're hanging around. Well, I think there's some kind so. of uh, weight that comes yeah. to it, maybe. Some, some, kind of, some kind of authenticity, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, New York is, you know, 308 languages spoken here. Yeah, yeah. that's crazy. You know, it's, 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 not, it's not America. This is a global city. It's for everyone. It really is. I mean, that's like 50% of the people here are not, they're not Americans and they're definitely not New Yorkers. Mm -hmm. So, and that's what makes it amazing. I mean, it's, yeah, I do especially remember... Brooklyn because yeah. Brooklyn is a much different animal. Mm -hmm. um, it, in fact, uh, Margaret Crawford, uh, when she was at Harvard, uh, um, she had said, if there was ever a chance for utopia on earth, it would be Brooklyn. 
because it's this rainbow of people from different income classes and ethnicities and races and, mm. and backgrounds. And we actually pretty much get along. Yeah. And it's that, <laughs> yeah. that mix, you know, meeting people from everywhere where you don't assume anything just by someone's look. And you have no idea. Some guy in a, you know, ragged t-shirt could probably be, uh, you know, a billionaire or a Princeton professor, I, who knows? There's just not, there's no way to, uh, to really judge people here. It's, it's uh, you know, and more cities are like that. Uh, but definitely uh, the creative class thrives here. It's the most amount of creative class folks hmm. uh, in the United States are here in Brooklyn. You know, something that's come up in this uh, show a number of times is that uh, since New York has changed so much um, since, let's say, the 70s with that, and a lot of the creativity was before very central in like lower Man in Manhattan, right? And there's still pockets of it in Manhattan, may maybe, but not really. It's all been pushed like way far out to, um, oh, I'm forgetting my neighborhoods now, but not bed -Stuy, Bushwick, Bushwick and, and et cetera. Is it tough for the city to retain some of that identity when... It's pushing things out to the more to the periphery. I mean, you know, uh, so I lived in Bushwick when I first left Cambridge, and this was in 2006. And I, I could say that it was it was a bit of a wasteland, but that's where artists moved. And there was a place called Third Ward there at the time, which was this facility for people doing dance, theater carpentry and art and you could share in these like like super high quality studio spaces and bushwick was just beginning to become something mm. and it took less than a year for my landlord to double my rent oh. it was just enormous how quick the gentrification happened uh, and so i had to move out uh and you know there, it's further and further away uh, bushwick but they also renamed it East Williamsburg. <laughs> Wait, so but just, that's not an official thing. I felt I thought that there was people in Bushwick trying to, you know, up their property value by saying it's East Williamsburg. What what else is new? We we had a project in Detroit where uh actually it it didn't pay very well. This was also some time ago. But uh they said, but like, you know, what can we do with the city of Detroit? We've had some of the finest minds in architecture, urban design and planning thinking about this issue for a decade or more. You know, what, what could possibly happen to transform the city of Detroit? Mm. And if you look around Detroit, like all the adjacent zip codes are thriving communities. So I was just said, change the name. Mm -hmm. You switch the name or divide it up to a couple more zip codes, it just loses that affect. It loses its previous posture and, and could be something different and reinvent itself. So it's it's um, maybe it's a developer trick, perhaps. Uh, and it's done informally, but over time, it actually takes hold because there really is now in, in, in East Williamsburg, and then Bushwick is even further out. And the Bushwick's brand has changed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, also, you know, you have to remember there was a someone that was a detractor for Bushwick for some time. Uh, this famous comedian in the 80s, uh, Eddie Murphy, was from there. So he would often go on, you know, he's oh, on yeah. HBO, these massive stages. Yeah. And he'd say, I'm from Bushwick and I'm never going back. And more or less talk about how criminal the place was. So it, it took a very long time to undo that. And, you know, parts of it today are, are thriving. And it's, you know, it's, it's uh, one of those many areas in New York that are just, you know, they're, they're just, it's, it's in constant transformation. These yeah. are real liminal, liminal spaces. Uh, Harlem is transforming, yeah. although after the pandemic, um, mm. I don't think so. Mm. Uh, and I, I actually, I lived up in Harlem. I'm, the, I'm not comfortable with the transformation up there. On the west so, or the east? Uh, west side. Yeah. yeah. East, east, very different. Mm. Uh, and I'm not talking near Columbia University. I'm talking actually, you know, Martin Luther King and, and Frederick Douglass, mm -hmm. those areas, mm -hmm. uh, which are deep in there, like 130 something street. Mm -hmm. And this is, uh, this is where you could see gentrification just instantly today. You'll see, usually it's, uh, a Caucasian person <laughs> moves yeah. it, moves into a brownstone and yep. kicks out five, uh, black families. Mm -hmm. And then they live in that 
that that that home by themselves and then they wonder why everyone around them is so upset and uh, you can see coffee shops for you know one kind of person and then places for others in these two worlds like they're just not meeting well uh, and uh, you know it's i think in, in some places that are more neutral you know gentrification there there's there's positive things it could be a positive force for change but up there it just seems like that's a, a community that belongs to uh a certain peoples and their ethos mm -hmm. a and to see to see that change is a little upsetting at least change as far as how that community um exists there and being s supplanted by mm -hmm. totally different groups uh, with a different form of wealth uh, so that's hard yeah uh, well, I mean, do you think it's possible, though, for places to change in a positive way, but not bring all the other stuff that comes with gentrification? Because it's it's it almost always comes hand in hand. Yeah, can can places change in a positive way? Sure, yes, of course. But you know, I could be more succinct about mm. that. Uh, one of the fields that I practice in urban design, like that, is supposed to be our sort of expertise, mm -hmm. and as a professional in that field. I could say we can absolutely control and author design. Like we can speculate, we can think long term, we can produce scenarios. Actually, that kind of work is very valid. But that does not mean we can control the other half of urban design, which is urbanity. And that's going to happen for a whole host of honestly unknown reasons. Like they're just not within the purview of our profession or really any profession. Uh, you can anticipate many things and you can see trends and you can guess, but no one really has a hold on what the future is like. You can't, can't make those predictions, whether you're in economics or mm. architecture it doesn't, or political science, if you, anthropology, it's just, you just can't. And when you try and make those predictions and think they'll be accurate, that that's a mistake. You also have to remember as you produce those long-term thoughts, and I don't mean futurist, although they're kind of confusing, they're similar terms, but, mm. but as you make those predictions, you have to think of them as this, um, as a book, Black Swan, that describes it better. But if you think it's like steering a boat and you could steer that boat if you're in New York and, and sort of point it towards, um, let's say, I don't know, London, but if you're off by five degrees, you know, that boat's going to end up someplace in Africa. So you just have to remember like the, anytime you predict models or think that you can show the projection or change in a city, even being slightly off in your models or your ideas, they can just over time that mistake that failed course correction sure. will just ramify and ramify. So when you say urbanity, you mean uh, the whole, the city as a whole, like the, 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 the social aspects, the cultural aspects, like all of that stuff is what you mean? Yeah, uh, anything and everything that mm. makes up the wonder of a city, which yeah. is, you know, an absolutely brilliant, a brilliant superorganism in and of itself. I mean, it's just, there's, there's almost no extent or constraint model or border really for a city. I mean, we, we have ideas, but it, it's all resource intensive. It is connected to so many parts of our planet. I'm, I'm talking about the, the larger cities, mm -hmm. but even the smaller ones have a carbon footprint and, 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 and extend well beyond their kind of geopolitical boundaries. So it's uh, so, yeah, when I mean urbanity, I mean everything that makes up a place where, you know, it's from thriving to the, the derelict. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of interesting this conversation because it, I remember at one point I was um, having a conversation with a group of urban designers and um, or to be urban designers. I, I have and, those conversations. Uh, yeah, too. <laughs> <laughs> it happens to you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and someone had posed the question of like, what is urban design? And then there was this kind of discussion and debate about the definition of urban design. And I, it's. I'd be curious to get your input on it because at that time I was like, oh, that's a fucking stupid question. It seems pretty obvious what urban design is, the design of, of if you understand that, if you say it is architecture, the design of buildings approximately, then urban design is the design of urban spaces, urban places. But mm -hmm. 
I, I don't I don't know why that was a question for them amongst urban designers. They seem you'd think they would know the answer to it, but it, uh, what is your thought on that? Yeah, well, um, to define urban design, uh, first of all, I think it's the most phenomenal field. I think mm. it's it is in a kind of a hierarchy, although you could probably begin it at a younger age, at a younger moment in one's career, but. I don't think it's as effective. I think you actually need to be an architect with years of uh, practice under your belt before you can truly start comprehending urban design. Uh, you can get into urban studies. That's different. Uh, that's the theory of cities. Planning also mm. different. Urban planning is a, is a different field. Urban design is kind of like, um, uh, you know, the, the I don't want to say the brain surgery of architecture, but it's, it's, it's the you're moving so many different actors and agents to think about how these relationships occur, where they occur, and in one, what scope or time frame they're happening in, and who it affects and why, and then to speculate through visions or images, projects that extend far beyond just a single boundary. So it's 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 a all encompassing field. Um, it's pretty fantastic. And I worked or studied or both with some of the most phenomenal urban designers that, uh, that ever lived, at least in my time frame. And you know, Alex Krieger, uh, who was head of the department at the GSD, uh, you know, was my thesis advisor. Hmm. And he often would say, you can't really define urban design, <laughs> in part because just what I've said, the, the design part is something we know, but urbanity is, you know, it seems to be boundless and our control over it is uh, minimal. Uh, so mm -hmm. that's, that's fair to say. It's also comes from, you know, Kevin Lynch, uh, probably the best books on it is good city form, uh, which is just amazing. But he had, he had written that at MIT and essentially invented the field as city design, mm -hmm. not urban design, but invented it as that first. And then it was taken by cert, uh, at the GSD and launched as a program in urban design before MIT can do it. So they actually have the first program in that field was at the GSD and, and amazing people have gone through that program. It's a lot smaller than, uh, the MARC and, uh, it's, um, you know, it, it go, it, it seems to be concerned with architecture. Yep. and everything around it and you know movements later on like landscape urbanism i think is really a part of urban design i mean it's you know many people would make that argument it's just yep. the the interest in the uh ground not the figure right yeah and that's uh that's still fascinating because there is just way more ground than there is figure <laughs> that's a good point <laughs> yeah that's yeah. a good point um it's funny because uh, so i have a bachelor of architecture and a master's of urban design or slash urban planning and um at least the undergrad that i went to and it seems to be the case in a lot of architecture schools that the three professions of architecture urban design slash urban planning they're not really the same thing i say but th that kind of category and landscape architecture are very siloed and like very very separate mm. and um i would actually even say also that urban design is not really i don't know why there are not more pro programs that teach it at the undergrad level or even the, the graduate level this seems to be not as certainly not as mainstream as architecture yeah the 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 there i don't know how many programs teach it at undergrad it's it's a newer thing I think the first one here was at the new school at Parsons oh. in New York City was the first one that would teach urban design. Uh, Victoria Marshall was the department head mm -hmm. uh, at the undergraduate level. <clears throat> and again, it was a it was a heavy link to landscape. Yeah. Um, you know, I, it's just uh, again, you could do urban studies or similar fields that look at cities uh, and bring in other areas like anthropology or uh, you know economics that make up really good urban planners or city thinkers but i think urban design if you really if you really want to understand it it's a field that you know requires an understanding of architecture uh, and and having an experience with it and landscape architecture yeah so it's, it's just it's just uh, there are savants and maybe there's a there's there's something to be said about naivete 
as one enters the field. Maybe you don't need to have that background, but I just, uh, I, I, I think it's a very, very mature interest. It takes some time. Like, you know, if you get, if you get really good uh, folks who are interested in architecture, they're so hell bent on function, aesthetics, engineering, theory, I mean, it's just unbelievable amounts of theory. And even getting all of that right is just, <laughs> you're still, you know, you've only tip of the iceberg yeah. as far as what you've discovered. And then to just think you can do that in multiples all yeah, at sure. once um, at such a different scale uh, is, is a lot of hubris. So I, I, it, of course it's possible. I don't want to be dogmatic about anything. Uh, because I, I teach individualized study. I'm a professor <laughs> of individualized study. So yeah. I'm, I'm okay with you choosing your own verse when yeah. it comes to how you explore um, academia. But I, um, I, re I, 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 I have a lot of faith that urban design seems... It's, it's also a field that is not afraid to ask all kinds of questions that lead you down other rabbit holes. I mean, yeah. I, I remember when I was studying it, I would... I took formal classes in real estate and finance. I took classes in housing policy. And that was a lot different than the architecture classes I had taken in housing, which was mostly the, the function, the context, uh, certainly the form of the building, its operation, but it had nothing to do with the financial charts uh, or uh, understanding the real estate behind it and the policies and the codes and how they're implemented. But, studying that was a world of difference. It had design was not even mentioned. Yeah. It was it was all about how you finance a housing project and what goes into a section eight grant and what's the history of it and what happened with urban renewal and and then putting something like that uh, into uh, into a plan that would look at a five to 25 year uh, implementation and the costs and the management and the maintenance associated with it didn't really care what the roof looked like. It just made sure that you understood that eventually there'd be some repairs needed uh, and hopefully not, and that uh, this needs to fit into an equation to get people there at an affordable rate and to guarantee that over time and to produce that uh, structure for leasing, et cetera. And that, I, you know, I had studied housing, housing at uh, in architecture at Columbia in the program that I was in before, we would spend one entire year on that as our studio projects. So it was, it was housing. And, you know, in that entire time, I did none of the financing, none of the development side, nothing. We had those individuals on the reviews. Yeah. They were, certainly gave their input. <laughs> but that's a lot different than actually doing the math yourself and understanding that calculus. So it wasn't until much later, mm -hmm. you know, almost a decade before as studying urban design, I realized I, I actually need to know what developers do and then <laughs> actually do it. Yeah. yeah. It's it's super complicated. I totally get what you're saying. I guess maybe the, the larger place that I'm coming from is I just wish at the very least there would be more urban studies, mandatory urban studies courses in, uh, in architecture degrees. Like even just a few courses, like good ones, you know. But that doesn't, architect, architecture has become, I think, even more siloed in a certain way and we have our own theory that we investigate, which is great and good, but there's a tendency to kind of exclude all the other things you mentioned that don't ever, they come to reviews exactly as you said, they come to reviews, they drop a few like, you know, 10 minutes of knowledge and they leave. And that's like the extent of your exposure to these other things, which, you know, dictate, dictate, dictate or impact, you know, architecture specifically in this case. I, you know, if, if um, I've sat on faculty meetings, this is when I was, um, actually one of my first faculty jobs at the uh, School of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Hmm. And they had hired me to replace uh, the a professor of sculpture that they thought was no longer relevant. <laughs> he, was, he was all figure-based and clay-based sculpting, uh, mostly of busts and things like that. Very traditional uh, method in sculpture that's everywhere and had been around for centuries. And they said he's had his century and can you do everything he does um, with computational tools? We think there's a big future in that and we just don't have the room to put that in the curriculum. 
these students are here for two years. Some are only in a one-year program. Mm. They just don't have time to do uh, sculpture with clay uh, for the figure. They don't think that's relevant. But understanding sculpture as far as from computation and in, in, in digital space, they think there's that needs to happen. And you know, a faculty of that size and their interest, they can make a decision and they can pivot. Yeah. In, in architecture schools, it's it's almost impossible to say what we should throw out. It's like they just refuse to admit that any bit of knowledge is is uh, anachronistic or no longer useful, doesn't work, and, mm. and God knows who's been teaching it for how many decades yeah. and, and they're tenured. <laughs> yeah, tenured, but it's it's also it's just it's just so piled up. Mm. I, you know, I I don't know exactly what your experience is, but you know, I I had to learn how to do drafting. You know, we had slide rules, and we you know did it with mechanical pens and and inked on mylar yep. with uh, drafting tools, uh, and we would have a you know a traditional set of you know architectural instruments. I mean, I, I don't know how many years later, I have not seen that in architecture schools for a long time. But there's there's this the, all everything is based on that, and there's still some expectation of maybe you should know how to do that. Mm -hmm. And there'll be some course someplace, a drawing course, where they're going to give you that assignment, which is here's some rapidiograph pens and do some ink on mylar. Yeah. And, and I was like, oh. I mean, you've heard of a plotter, right? It's just, <laughs> it's, but at the same time, it's, it's as if we don't want to lose any part of the art. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, that's what's probably great about architects is we are that intense. We always have been. We just, we're, we were nice people, but we're so <laughs> intense in demands of uh, what we expect for ourselves and for others in our field. It just seems like there shouldn't ever be a weak point. And that, that many, much of that comes from the atelier. Mm. Uh, and, and that's, and it could have never have anticipated the transformation technology has given us. That doesn't necessarily mean it's, it's better. It's just a different thing. So we just keep on lumping on more requirements, yeah. more directions. Uh, and even now in architecture, uh, you know, I, I've been leading at least one of the camps towards biotech or bioengineering in architecture or synthetic biology in architecture. It's, it's just yet another uh, kind of component that we add to the pedagogy and our dialogue. And I, th I think it's very relevant. It means, okay, another year somehow going back to basics in biology and then looking at new techniques and genetics and then incorporating how you might think about that in your design. And then you, you can't possibly be all these things at once. I mean, after mm -hmm. years and years of study or at least uh, practice and study, and you, you can get a better comprehension of it. I mean, I, I know I'm sort of skipping around, but you know, I always wondered why it took People like uh, Daniel Liebskind, or you know, I just uh, I, I, there's a ton of them, but uh, Louis Kahn, until they were in their 50s before they actually built something that represented their work or even built anything. Yeah. I mean, Frank Gehry was late 40s, 50s before he actually did something that's a Frank Gehry. And, and it just seems to take that long to get there. And I was so happy this year turning 50. <laughs> Finally, the, the youngest of the old people and uh, can start start doing this work that has been gestating for decades. Mm. And, uh, you know, and I, you know, I can't say that if I had known that when I was uh, a teenager, I would have changed course because that wouldn't be possible. I've, wanted, I've been wanting to do architecture since I was, I don't know, five or six. I started working as an apprentice or an intern at the age of 14 and still, still, I feel like I don't know enough. Mm. Uh, um, especially when I look at, you know, like Rem, you know, or some of these guys that are amazing with, uh, you know, detailing concrete and have put together maybe five buildings, you know, like really five buildings that took seven to eight years to construct and they know every detail. That's just enormous amount of knowledge. Uh, so the, those spec writers and mm. to to those who have a vast understanding of urbanism and theory and it's just I think we get better with age. It is phenomenal. So you 
had an interest in architecture from that young of an age. Why is that? Is it because you grew up in the city and buildings were around you or your parents were architects? Uh, yeah, my, I, we had, we had architects in the family. Hmm. Um, and I, I was so interested in art making things. I mean, I don't, I guess it was art. It was just interested in creativity, hmm. uh, be a better term. Uh, cause it, it wasn't focused anywhere. And then, um, you know, my father insisted that I just don't do art, that I would <laughs> apparently not make any money and starve. <laughs> so be so be an architect. <laughs> exactly. So yeah. be an architect. Yeah. As if like, you know, this is gonna <laughs> just wash you in, in, in uh, money. Uh, so yeah, that was a sort of the, the gentle nudge of my uh, my parents just uh, constantly backing that. But it, it came from just an incredible love of drawing and making things and a permission in a sort of uh, rarefied environment where they encouraged me to make and draw all kinds of um, whatever I felt like it. A lot of space stuff, honestly, hmm. moon colonies and what else. Um, <laughs> and after having kids of my own, I have two daughters. I, I, I just, I, I, you know, I, I didn't want to, I didn't think gender has anything to do with it, but it, it's uh, the, the forces around you do influence hmm. the things that you're interested in. I, I don't. There's probably some genetic, some natural tendency to be interested in certain things, but I, I think there's a big part of it is your context. So I was always trying to get my kids to, you know, think astronauts in space or robots <laughs> or whatever, and they, you know, and they. They went back. They vacillated, but as soon as they they're old enough to play with their friends, it, you know, there was a big Barbie phase and a princess <laughs> phase, and, and I <laughs> let it happen. Yeah, <laughs> of course. Interesting. Uh, so, at what point did and you went and you ended up getting a bachelor of professional studies at university at Buffalo? But at what point did um, your scope, I suppose, like expand from architecture to urban design scale? Assuming that when you started, architecture was more or less, you know, buildings, single buildings. Yeah. Um, so Buffalo uh, was absolutely amazing. Probably the best education I ever got. Really? And there I, I was studying. You don't, you don't have an architecture program uh, at first. So uh, it's a massive flagship institution uh, for state school. Uh, you know, just some background. My, my parents had no money. Uh, you know, we, we came from, uh, actually, yeah, well, that'll be another story about uh, later on, but we didn't have any money. So it was the best place to study. It costs nothing to be there. I mean, I think um, I had a Pell Grant and my four years of education was free as long as I kept my grades up, which was pretty amazing. And I, I had a minor in art history and I was studying uh, intaglio printmaking as well as uh, taking courses in architecture. Uh, we, my first class there was in Diefendorf Hall in 1990, and it was 300 students uh, with this guy, Professor Dennis Andraco. And he said, look to your left, look to your right. Those people won't be here by mid-semester. And out of all of you in this room, 300, about 12 are actually going to make it into architecture grad school. And of those 12, one of you will be an architect. That's crazy. And he was damn right. Uh, everyone just was, for various reasons, all of my friends and some of the best friends, I mean, they more or less dropped out over the years. Hmm. Um, I think there's actually, there, no, there is one other guy. So he wasn't actually totally right. But uh, <laughs> so two of three. Just, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was just an astounding. And then, so the program there was that you had to have two years of grades to then reapply to the program inside Buffalo to get into the undergraduate architectural studies program. Hmm. And so you needed a portfolio and a, a book, which is a, a, a kind of a journal of all of your sketches and ideas and things you've been studying. And so, uh, yeah, they, they only accepted, I think it's like under 15 people get accepted into that part of the program. I don't know what, how much it's changed. I don't know if they offer the BPS anymore. Uh, I, I, um, but it was a very, very intense program. I was going to uh, college in the summer, taking courses, just because there was 
you know, so much demand to fill up that journal and have a, an amazing portfolio. Um, you know, and I, I was obsessed with Cooper Union, too, at the hmm. time. I applied to Cooper Union when I was 16, and I didn't get in. Uh, it was crushing. I was just like, oh, my God. It's just, you know, I'm never going to be any good. And just like, <laughs> at the age of 16, <laughs> it's over. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Now you feel that way. It's yeah. like you feel I met I met someone who got in the same year as I did, and I, I don't know if you know about the Cooper Union home test. Uh, no, no, actually. So they... They still do it. They, you have one month. They give you an exam. It's seven or eight questions, and you have to draw the answers to the questions, and you submit them. <laughs> and uh, I, I spent a full month on that test um, every day, coming back from school. And uh, you know, I, I, there there are questions like, um, uh, you know, this is the house of Asterion, and inside the house, which is a labyrinth made of many troughs, uh, there is a minotaur. And somewhere uh, the minotaur will meet Asterion, draw this house. And then the next question would be, uh, <laughs> the eternal traveler is traveling in uh, the library of Babel, uh, based on a Borges poem. And he travels for infinity, looking at the books, realizing that the disorder is an order draw that library oh my god wait this is to get yeah. into the school as this is to get into the cooper union as yeah. an, as an undergrad undergrad yeah as a kid out of high school remember it's free education <laughs> no, I, 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 I guess that that outweighs yeah. i guess it balances itself in some that's in some insane. regards that's pretty intense yeah. that's and really they don't, intense. supposedly don't care about your background or anything else except for how you do on that test and yeah. and uh you know i you know i don't stand by some of my answers Okay. All these years. <laughs> but uh you know uh, i worked hard to understand that i mean uh, there was a uh, another question was on matisse's piano lesson uh so you know this is this is just a really intense thing but i, I met someone who had gotten in the same year i did and uh she was a, a pot dealer uh <laughs> i wasn't smoking weed at the time but uh she was you know had gotten accepted the same year i applied and i said what did you draw for the library of Babel, for the eternal traveler looking at the disorder. She said, oh yeah, I spent a day on the test. I made some drawings. For that one, I, I drew a cat chasing a ball of yarn. What? Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. And I just, I just thought like, you know, the faculty or whoever was reviewing it was probably so stunned. They're like, genius or <laughs> idiot? <laughs> Right, like mm, I'm just gonna guess, must be a genius. Yeah, <laughs> this is just, who would do that? Uh, so you know, she took my spot. I just, you know, oh, uh, she never became an architect. It's it doesn't mean anything, and and sure. any kind of single test that judges your whole life is for morons. It's wrong. Yeah, whether it's an SAT, a GRE, a, a home <laughs> test of drawing, this is. No, there is no standard way of understanding how someone will perform in school or in life. And the only thing actually that shows whether you're uh, going to be successful in anything you do is perseverance. Mm -hmm. It's the ability to fail and then to get up and do it again and, and do it better and to learn from your mistakes. And, you know, there, there's people that say you should learn from others' mistakes. That's also true. Yes, it's it's better to learn from other others' <laughs> mistakes than your own, uh, but doesn't mean you 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 know you give up, and, and that's what you know that's what you need to know. So not getting into Cooper Union, uh, just I think I was depressed for a few years and then uh, just found myself. Is the lesson not, of not giving up particularly important for? I think it's certainly important for architects, or maybe also <laughs> <laughs> definitely for architects. Yeah. Yeah, otherwise, the building would never happen. Uh, right. uh, you would even do one building, um, but also maybe for um, a practice like yours, like urban design, which is um, you know relies heavily on research, where um, it's maybe how do I say this? Uh, sort of more detached from the general public and maybe a lot of folks of the general public don't quite understand what you guys are doing um, because it's more intellectual because it's more abstract because it's a bigger scale and much more complicated than a building I don't know where I was going with that I got lost in my own thought right right you, you, I was fixing my <laughs> mic but the public doesn't know what urban design is and that's that's the problem with the profession it's just 
anyone who gets a degree in urban design is going to work as an architect hmm. and just simply refer to themselves as an architect. It's just, that's just, that's a fact. It's, you just don't also design cities. Sure, sure. <laughs> like, you know, well, have you seen that place outside of France for, you know, 6 million people? I design that. It's not <laughs> true. I mean, you can do that. There is examples. Chandigarh, uh, Brasilia, um, Mazdar, like it's sure that's possible. These are one offs and, uh, it takes a, it doesn't necessarily mean they, well, they're important. They push the field, but we work as architects. It's a simpler way of describing it. Mm. And, uh, you know, I, I can imagine a, a future where the name is a little bit better because I don't think it accurately describes the field and, and uh, the name architect have, or the name urban, urban designer urban designer okay yeah. Yeah. that's a it is a troubling term it's not tr i mean I, i'm i'm in love with it but i i think it's it's more than what it alludes to it mm -hmm. just is it just just is um and i'm very happy with both those words urban and design like, yeah absolutely but it's it's not quite blended together mm -hmm. I mean, an architect is a blend of other terms. Right. As a, we see it as a single word. So we, we haven't arrived at that yet. And, and the language isn't there and the, the public understanding and awareness isn't there hmm. to, to kind of describe what it is that we do. There, the, there is a number of folks who talk about futurism. and Urban design can take that route. But everyone in architecture and urban design is speculating and thinking long term which is a Stuart Brand sort of term, the guy who did the Whole Earth Catalog. I mean, long-term thinking, working on wicked problems, that's important. It's important for humanity. And urban design is an amazing place to begin that as a study and then eventually a practice. Gives you that, that capability to almost be clairvoyant and to put just the right amount of pieces on the board so that something that's liminal uh sees some sort of uh reification becomes mm -hmm. you know less abstract and and has like uh, the beginning of a pattern uh, so you know there there was an, another professor who said that urban design is like painting a watercolor in a stream and i <laughs> love that as a definition because it's you are making marks and then they just flow sort of takes it away but you have to get just enough of a mark, like maybe mm -hmm. a rock, mm -hmm. to place it in that stream, colored blue, so that you can you can sort of tease or adjust or nudge the flow around that rock. Okay, I'm, I'm being a little bit out there right now, but it, but it's uh, there is that kind of uh, you know uncontrolled uh, sort of chaos that you're asked to sort of define yeah. and provide boundaries. I'm pretty sure there's a Delanda essay. On that. <laughs> it's 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 really challenging. I mean, I I think the, um, regarding urban design itself and the designing of cities to whatever extent, um, <clears throat> a lot of what you're describing, you know, it's, it's very parallel to the idea of scripting. It, you're you're creating rules and rule sets, and you're you have an idea of you're hoping to do good, right? You don't want to do evil, but you kind of have to let time, like decades, go by almost, and see like let's see how this plays out because sometimes a change happens that is for good reasons we think and then it has these catastrophic effects or it's a hybrid of things it's just it's kind of hard to know absolutely and you're you're in there to provide this kind of primordial soup of code mm. and results and then sort of guess and tweak and adjust to see the emergent properties and then find something that just has the right set of metrics and interests and functionality and then use that as the next thread to produce the next iteration or eventually decide you have to stop and, and keep it as it is. It's very similar to, to uh, creative coding. Um, definitely. And it's a, it's a different form of craft. It's, mm. it's not a science I and mean, science is a part of it, but it's, it has that, uh, that sort of learned edge that comes from skill and recognition and uh, um, in search hmm. or you, know, you have to explore. You know, it's it's not like you know what it is up front all the time. When you you want to use it as a tool that helps you find or discover things, it's another part of it. So completely get that. Um, An interesting topic is uh, use the word metrics, and um, 
I we certainly now have I feel like access to much more information about cities. Um, how much of that drives the design work and the thinking of the and the projects you guys do versus? Uh, I don't want to say it's guesswork versus like more like intuition, more like uh, grand theories. I, f I feel like maybe before a lot of the, the larger urban plannings were kind of based on, uh, well, they, things just evolved or when big interventions happened, they were based on big theories that weren't necessarily based in science. It was more like I have this idea of this theoretical of whatever, and I'm going to put it out there because I think it's going to work and let's see what happens. But now we have all these metrics. So how much of your work is more based on... The metric versus other stuff if that makes sense uh well you know facts facts are great and metrics and your ability to uh, index them is very useful and as long as you accept they're a pattern of what came before i think it's okay so if you're going to look at something like the amount of waste produced in a city which is something that we've done uh the type of waste the tonnage its sources and the data that's very real and something that extends far back to a certain moment uh, and, and then having comparative models, this is, this is useful. And you can diagram that and you can explain it and communicate it very well. Uh, and there, there are ways to do that visually and there, you know, there are ways to express that to the client or to a municipality. But, it, but that's that's it. It's kind of, to me, it's, it's a review of the literature. So th th you can then add them into a model that, that can tease out different results. Uh, so metrics are useful on that level, but there, it's at any point after that, you are, you're getting into uh, prediction, uh, you know, clairvoyance, guesswork. You know, it's, um, it's just you to not do that would would be uh, a crime, honestly. So I think it's a it's a for us, any of those the hard facts is just it's the starting point. There's also a, a limitation of how much you can know, given any amount of time. Mm -hmm. uh, Jeffrey West at the Santa Fe Institute, uh, his latest book on scale, is probably the uh, the leading scientist on data and metrics and cities. And it's this is like a twenty-year study, and he's still not there. And he's looking at uh, models of infrastructure, where he's going down to measuring the amount of copper wire, the amount of asphalt poured, the amount of inventions or patents filed in a particular zip code, the uh, ton, of, the amount of lighting in an area, and electricity per hour is the amount of data and metrics that he's acquired to understand a city is enormous. And then he'll come up with these, this, he has this grand theory of, um, you know, sublinear results that, you know, more or less the bigger the city, the more efficient it becomes. <laughs> and because it's so much is already in place and existing, it's easier for new things to plug into that infrastructural environment. And if you're small, uh, it's it's a lot harder to succeed, and you have a higher uh, metabolic rate. But he can he compare he had the exact same model in biology, hmm. where he compared a mouse to an elephant, <laughs> and he said a mouse is nowhere near as efficient as an elephant. And the building blocks are the same, and that's part of it. Like the cell of a of a mouse is the everything is made up of cells. Uh, the cell of a mouse is this, more or less the same as the cell of an elephant. It's just how elephants use them and process them and their burn rate and their carbon and everything associated with the amount of energy uh, that they uh, take up uh, it becomes more and more efficient as you get larger. Uh, th like examples are uh, if, you, if, a, if a mouse is sick, it requires a certain amount of, let's say, medication to, to, get that, to make sure that mouse is well. If an elephant is sick, it requires more medication, but not in direct comparison to mm -hmm. the size of the elephant. So it's it's still a few drops will actually work to help that elephant. Or the amount of food that a mouse consumes is much greater than what an elephant consumes uh, to keep it alive uh, in proportion to its body. Mouse, a mice, a mouse, sorry, will consume actually more food 
than what an elephant would con consume if mm -hmm. you scale the two things up. If, if you took the amount of food a mouse eats and tried to give that to an elephant, it would be <laughs> enormous. <laughs> and it doesn't work. Elephants don't eat their own mass. Right. But the elephants don't need to. So he's saying the same thing relate. And that was an idea of, of nonlinear scaling in, bi in metabolic biology. So he had applied those same indices to cities. And, and I guess he's proven it. There's just that no one in urban design we're just not a field that has dived into that level of science to to say otherwise. Is that one of the biggest challenges with the profession, or yeah, the profession where not enough people are relying on the studies that are happening uh, because it's I don't I don't know I mean uh, yeah yeah. Well, I mean, uh, I wish I could explain my Jeffrey West a little bit better, but but it, but the problem is is that there's just not enough doctoral students in the field. Huh. Like, you know, every other field, uh, you know, to be a biologist requires getting a doctorate. To be a chemist requires getting a doctorate. To be a physicist requires getting a doctorate. And that's years and years of study to learn something exactly the way it was done before in a canon of, of that field. And then later on, show how you make one incremental change or improvement. Mm -hmm. And then prove that to basically uh, the field. It's just not what happens in urban design doesn't happen in architecture, at least not that way with that kind of uh, representation. Mm -hmm. you, it's you don't you're not expected to do, to do all of that study in, in the university. And if you have, you know, thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people doing doctoral work, making advances specifically in the field, you can imagine we'll be able to take on the Santa Fe Institute and have a group of 30 or 40 scientists in the field of urban design and re first do replicate uh, Jeffrey West's theory and data and then uh, find out, you know, f and find out whether or not it's, it's absolutely accurate. And then second, improve upon it. And just we don't do that. So and, and since he's in this, he's, he's, he's a sort of physicist. He is a physicist. Uh, that's decided to do biology that has then decided to do uh, hmm. urban studies he's just she's alone in this niche he's made for himself uh, and I just didn't have time when I was doing my doctorates to unravel Jeffrey West's work <laughs> <laughs> so how much of your your work your ongoing work today um it re requires like intense collaboration with people from outside fields like biologists or uh, people more in the science um, realm yeah, everything we do uh especially at terraform uh, we work with people from other disciplines uh we're uh you know we're multi-disc ourselves so uh you know it's just the idea that you would just be one thing is it doesn't is not healthy in our lab or in the environment that surrounds us so we've worked with some very um different folks i think sometimes probably the first at least that i can recall but i, I have not done that study but but as an architect working with entomologists i can't ah, there must have been a moment in history where that's happened uh but uh, not in recent times right. so that's sort of one class uh um, molecular cell biologists are another group that we team up with uh, often certainly anyone in ecology and a lot of that has happened in landscape architecture especially in like fields like forestry and conservation studies and now sustainability is its own or sustainability management that's that happens you know more often and that's great uh you know there's also like the creative class that we'll work with so it's not just someone in totally different fields like entomology or geography you know we'll talk to a, a street musician uh, they'll, they'll have something to say about revisioning their neighborhood mm. and it's almost just as valid as someone who's you know uh, um, an urban geographer so uh it the the disciplinary mindset is as open and as wide as possible it's the synthesis of that and its accuracy that sometimes works sometimes doesn't you know i i spent a lot of time not showing the mess like the mistakes that we make which is every project all the time. I just try and concentrate uh, concentrate on the, the sort of the finished, uh, the result of that effort mm -hmm. and somewhat polish it. 
but never make any promises that it's absolutely the end all be all. Everything I look at is just a variant or an iteration. Mm -hmm. How do you how do you guys find the the work that you do? Do you, do you like or with your team that like, come up with those ideas? Does someone approach you for that kind of thing? Is it based on I don't know years and years of research and interests and at some point like competitions? Like where does that come from? Well, all of that, all okay. of that. But it it does start from the idea that we want to be our own clients, mm -hmm. kind of like an architect's architect or an urban designer's urban designer. So it, the arguments start internally it's, mm -hmm. and happens for a whole host of reasons. You know, I'll get a student that'll say, um, listen, you know, eating meat is bad and uh, we can live off of insect protein. I'm like, okay. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and they want to start that as a legitimate research endeavor. Mm -hmm. And that would then we develop a question. Uh, And, and this is important because it's, it's very different than an architecture studio, which is you sort of know where you're going and you have some idea of form and you're, you mostly work the program to meet your aesthetic interests and also, well, it's not always the case, but it's research is you have no idea where it's going to end up. Right. And it, the hard part is establishing the thesis question. So come up with the principle that you're then going to study and it's, it's got to be very clear. So after doing some work, we one of the questions was, can New York City live, uh, you know, off of meat that is not cow, chicken, lamb, uh, pig, mm -hmm. uh, live off a protein source within its own geopolitical boundaries? Can we have a completely self-sufficient New York City where our food is only produced inside New York? And the first question was, can we'll look at the protein first? And can you have cow farms uh, in buildings? Can you have, you know, is it okay for chickens to be there? Do you want sheep or lamb? Every, I mean, so you start with mm -hmm. the absurd. Uh, MVRDV is kind of a, you know, they, they've done a lot of this uh, work early on in the 90s. And then we, we get to the pragmatics and the reality. And, and insect-based powder becomes uh, something that becomes more realistic. Uh, and then you get into the cultural issues of that. It's like, who's mm -hmm. going to eat yeah. crickets? But 80% of the world does. It's just in Europe and the United States, we don't eat bugs, at least not ones that we admit to. They're usually in contaminants in all our food sources. So we then get into the, the, the actual architecting of the, 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 food, the food itself, not only its source, but how it, the flavor and its texture and its production and its milling. Uh, we looked at cricket powder, which was actually infinitely good and much more realistic on a cultural side because people are not going to eat things with spiny legs and wings and eyeballs. <laughs> But you will eat a powderized yeah. form of something that just happens to taste great. So I, I talk about... Um, it's a psychological uh, thing. It is. If I told you what's in a gummy bear, while you're eating it, <laughs> you know, it's made of, you know, melted horse hooves. You'd be like, mm, I don't care. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it looks cute, you know, it tastes good, yeah. yeah. I mean, you have to remember things like lobster, which is, you know, <laughs> was, was uh, feared and fed to no one except for prisoners in Maine. Oh, really? Hardcore criminals were the only ones eating lobster <laughs> like uh, 100, 200 years ago. Oh. That was it. That you were that was part of your internment was the is that you you got you, <laughs> you had to eat this you're punished you, to, you have to eat lobster every day yeah, exactly <laughs> exactly and they're probably like mm, we don't know how good this is <laughs> like, some of the benefits <laughs> but uh you know so it, it took 200 years for people to realize it's a, a phenomenal cuisine so you know as you know urban designers we we speculate how is it possible in a city can we get humans to move to other sources of protein right and we also were operating under you know my partner is in the united nations we're operating under the united nations sustainable develop sustainable development goals the sdgs and one of them is to get people to um live on or not live on but eat more insect-based protein hmm. so you know that's sort of the demand and the reason is it's because it's you know 300 times less greenhouse gas emissions yeah. and 2,000 gallons less water, for the same gram of protein that wow. comes from an insect source wow. versus a cow. So it's amazing for the environment, but it's it's just something you can actually produce in cities. So you can go from pasture to plate with something like uh, a cricket. 
And that's an urban design problem. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, they never told me that in urban design school. <laughs> yeah, sure. It, it's, it's just that <laughs> I suddenly realized that this is a field that is probably the only field built to put all those different uh, spheres of interest together and then come up with a laudable project. And that was had a, that worked. Uh, you know, a lot of it was with um, entomologists and chefs and anything in between. So it's you get the creative side and you get the scientific side and then you need a project that makes sense. And I can tell you it was seven years of pretty much failure until eventually we got to something that uh, I feel confident is worth putting out there as a platform for the next group of urban designers or thinkers to then push it forward. So a number of questions with that. Um, with this project, did you guys actually make cricket powder and try it? Yeah. Uh, so we, there was there were two groups, a cricket bitter group to make a, a sort of a liquid form that you would put in drinks because uh, <laughs> we didn't know mm -hmm. where we'd be using it at the time. And then another group that was in the milling and the powderized form. And that those groups were um, they were adjacent to us. Uh, they were a, a startup company to make cricket bonbons. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> so it's a, they, they were really invested in getting higher quality crickets. And then there were manufacturers that were also a part that were a part of our group and not a part of our group. Uh, Brooklyn has, and this is now years ago, Brooklyn had, um, had produced a, a cricket bar that was sold in Whole Foods. And it was these two guys from Brown University and they created this company um, forgetting the name, but they, they were doing uh, a cricket powder mm -hmm. and putting it into a, a, a health bar. And f frankly, it tasted awful. <laughs> uh, it just, and their problem was the sourcing of the crickets. Huh. And, and they couldn't find most, most cricket farms, which there were very few, I think four in the United States, they were just for uh, pet food. So feeding your lizard or turtle or whatever. Uh, the crickets. So they, they, they were not sanitary by any means. Mm -hmm. They were these giant mud pits with, you know, concrete block dividers. There were thousands of crickets on top of one another, mm -hmm. their feces and babies and, you know, just mixing. And then eventually they get to a certain point, you just scoop them all up and mash them into bits and then heat them. Sounds send delicious. Them <laughs> yeah, send them off to the uh, the cricket bar company. <laughs> yeah, so, they, so, so, they, so yeah, we worked to understand that whole system and wow. question along the way. Uh, Joseph Yoon was a, another chef that we had worked with, and there's so many ways. He's an he uh, runs Brooklyn Bugs. It's a, a, a um, it's about eating all types of insects and scorpions and tarantulas. None of that was appealing to me. I just wanted to focus in on ones that were more logical. And those were mealworms and, and uh, crickets, because in our review of the literature, that they had the strongest likelihood of, of actually working out. Hmm. Um, you know, they're like, in that research, we had discovered the best thing for humanity to get a, an amazing source of protein that had an enormously long shelf life that was really easy to produce, that was almost impossible to go bad, that was filled with the most amount of intense nutrients and minerals you would ever want, that would be great for babies and everyone else, apparently came from um, roach milk. And we were just, there's no one that's going to Oh, no. Roach <laughs> no. milk. Roach milk. You gotta wow. rename that, you know. It's it's, it's like Bushwick. You gotta it. rename it's, it. <laughs> it. Yeah, I know it's a branding thing, but no, not, not no. where it is. Roach. So, it, so we we had to we had to have like the 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 anthropological side, the social side of our socio ecological right. thinking. Like we knew that there's no way that it's going to be hard enough to get people to eat powder from crickets or you know mealworms, let alone roach milk. Um, yeah, is. Um, the other thing is, I think it's really interesting the the completely open perspective that you guys approach the work, and you know, you're kind of saying urban design necessitates that that you start with the research. You have an idea, you have you have an idea of what the thesis could be, and the research kind of helps you decide what it needs to become. Um, is I was wondering if if 
if uh, trying to create things that are going to be successful and accepted by the general public is sometimes frustrating because it, it would be clear to you when you're doing your research like this is the solution it could work if, for all the other reasons for the the diet in this case or the economics of it and the 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 carbon emissions or whatever else it all works but you idiots are just too hung up i mean the roach milk is a bit of extreme string maybe but you yeah. idiots don't are not interested in a soft car you're not interested in x y or z like what come on uh you know uh <laughs> look we we have a client that has never left us or at least for me and uh i have uh i don't really talk to him but i try and think like he thinks or i should say his lack of thinking his lack of understanding his sort of uh you know um stiff obdurate impossible to change personality he's kind of representative of the average if there is such a thing average american mm -hmm. Uh, someone that just doesn't have the time to th think outside of the box or want to is is a bit of a klutz and uh, <laughs> you know has almost no access to any education or doesn't remember what he you know whatever his education was and if I can convince so that's Homer Simpson and I was I gonna can... say Peter Griffin but okay yeah, yeah. <laughs> Homer Simpson great so, so if we think like Homer yeah. every so often in a project and wonder if this would penetrate his mind and his stubbornness or his or affect his sort of you know his uh what's the term um idiosyncratic behavior like uh, get into his his general life lifestyle then 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 we've nailed it hmm. it's a, that is a massive goal like to to get to the the foreground of someone like that and to reach them to where they actually not only is is it something that's of interest but they can go a step further and adopt it they, they'll actually perhaps make that transformation so they'll they'll never you know homer simpson's never gonna eat a cricket but he'll definitely eat cricket powder if he doesn't really know it's cricket powder mm. or if it just tastes amazing doesn't look like a cricket and it's, it comes in like a you know a, a frito ch a, a frito <laughs> chip or a, you know some sort of a snack or it's a, the best pasta I've ever tasted actually came from cricket powder, wasn't egg based. And he just just enjoys the flavor. It's it's readily available, it's not too expensive, and and somehow it's healthy for him. But it shouldn't probably say that because Yeah, of course. Like, yeah, as not soon for as Homer. It, <laughs> yeah, exactly. As soon as you hear it's healthy, he's gonna think, nah, it can't be good. But uh um and maybe it doesn't actually have to be totally healthy. Maybe there's a version of it that's that's got some preservatives in it or starches and sugars. And I don't, I don't know. I shouldn't really think like that, but, but, but if it, if it gets to Homer, the rest of us will, you yeah. know, get on board a lot easier. Hmm. Cause I don't, I have no interest in changing people's behaviors. Never did, never will. And I, I really like the lifestyle of uh, a typical American mm -hmm. and, and I want to improve it. And I want to do it in a way that is stealth green. Mm. So it's it is phenomenal for the environment, but it doesn't have to advertise that up front. Mm. And that, that is the job for uh, industrial design. That's the job for designers. Right. <clears throat> right. So the cricket farm. So you guys, you know, <laughs> went all this way. And now you were saying like you're you're not going to push it any further necessarily. You just kind of like you planted the seed and somebody's going to take the seed over and try to push it, like, carry it or carry it down. Oh my God! Well, I mean, it, we, it was seven years on that project, oh, and, and they're, st they're still still doing it. Uh, it's just, um, you know, it, uh, it's we 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 got to the point of looking at um, uh, bulk manufacturing. So, hmm. so typically, when you when you productize something, there's the invention period, mm -hmm. you know, and then it's bench work. And then there is after bench work and invention, there is what we call batch. Batch is making lots of it. And that's where we got to, or you can you can make it in, in large amounts, like buckets of it. Uh, but bulk work is where you make a hundred thousand cases of it. You manufacture it at scale. And and each and every order, every magnitude is ten times the effort, if not a hundred times right. the effort. And 
you know, that's years of work, that's money, yeah. that's engineering processes, uh, that's regulations. And, yeah. and you know, if, where it gets produced becomes, you know, it's, it's not going to happen in your region because you're going to look globally on where you could reproduce this. And that's just not um, my thing. We, yeah. we have met people that were interested in, in uh, you know, bulk manufacturing. And uh, they were very serious about producing that. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg's uh, sister is apparently uh, invested in in cricket farming, and a few others consider it actually a type of uh, you know um, technology out of Silicon Valley. Hmm. But it, it didn't quite reach the scale because the Homer Simpson thing just sort of stopped. It, yeah, it's just just not there yet. Mentally. What they need to do is put that powder. Um, I mean, you mentioned the Sneak bars in Whole Foods. Put it in Whole Foods and, and put it under goop under Gwyneth Paltrow. Then you'll be fine. <laughs> she can sell whatever crazy candles and cricket powder is not a problem. Well, um, I mean, there, uh, what's her name? Uh, there is a number of these Hollywood types selling yeah. cricket powder, like an, an enormous amount of them. Uh, was it Tom Cruise's ex-wife? Uh, I'm forgetting. Her Katie name. Holmes? The other one. Nicole, uh, Kidman? Girlfriend. Nicole Kidman. Nicole Kidman is right. a big advocate for cricket eating. Oh, oh. oh uh, wow. And so, but, but you see, the thing is, is that that doesn't help Homer Simpson. She sure. just thinks right. some super wealthy, sophisticated actress out of Hollywood can eat that stuff. That's not for me. Mm. I'm an average guy. Like I don't do that. I'm not Nicole Kidman. I have nothing in common with her. So, so it does have their inverse or converse mm -hmm. effects and relationships sometimes with that. The you know the 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 question you brought up, Marina, kind of gets to a, a larger one, which is, how do you decide when a project should? Um, kind of end for you guys because you're you're totally right with the cricket project as an example. If you were going to do it full force, like you'd have to transform your what you do to now your cricket company. That's like the only thing you can do yeah. day and night. You have to get funding from a bunch of people, millions of dollars and whatnot, and it would be a product as you said. It's a different kind of that's a different thing. Um, so how do you know when to kind of and I'm sure it's not a, a hard, cold turkey stop, but when to kind of stop projects and when they're developed enough so that they could have uh, implications beyond y your, you know, uh, sweat equity. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, I don't. I just don't. Like we, look, I mean, um, it's a great question. And uh, I have suffered with this many times. Mm -hmm. I have seen folks that have worked for us They've come up with some idea, and I'd say that's just a terrible idea. Like that's <laughs> just, and I'd, I'd point out examples and reasons and my whole thinking, and then they go off, and a year and a half later, they're they're selling their company for three hundred forty million dollars, and they, <laughs> they built it right next to me. Uh, that was this group of guys actually that that started Jump, uh, this shared bike company. I'm like, there's no future in shared <laughs> bikes. It's like, eh, it's a, a fine. <laughs> graveyards of these things in china all of these failed companies with e-bikes and bike sharing and it's been around for i'd say 40 years you know you're not going to do anything different you're just going to lose all your money and your parents money it's the worst idea ever you know and then they, they had a sort of a simple change with a the gps locator and it was dockless and those were interesting and they mm. they sold the whole thing to uber in less than a year we <laughs> we worked on um uh working on printed meat or more specifically, uh, uh, um, in vitro meat products from an extracellular matrix from swine or pig cells. And we had taken a technique in regenerative medicine uh, that would allow you to reproduce bladders for patients with cancer. And we had used the same technique to produce industrially designed objects like belts, handbags, and purse and purses where you're not, it's a victimless leather that's printed from a modified inkjet printer and you're printing cells into a geometry that gets folded up and mm -hmm. a lot of that was on the architecture side it was fascinating as a research endeavor and we we did our best and pushed the boundaries on that and we produced like a one centimeter version of a 3d printed um, uh, cellular structure that got folded up and then produced this kind of in, in uh, what eventually became an in vitro meat house and, and that was three thousand dollars for that one little centimeter of material, and this came out of George Church's lab at, at Harvard, and and Oliver Medvedic was uh, he was my roommate at the time in uh, in school, and then later on he came over to Terraform, 
and worked as our chief science officer. And uh, he's a, a cellular, uh, molecular cell biologist. And so we get this project and we, you know, it, it works. And we propose all kinds of speculations and design ideas and put it out there. It was my first TED talk. Uh, and, you know, okay, like here we are. And I got a whole bunch of uh, comments and publications and still on that project and never thought to continue further on it because we were on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. So we didn't stop a project. We just sort of, it, it just sort of was paused in that stream of making things until there is just the next year, a guy presents a 3D uh, organ printer, a company called Organova. Uh, another person does uh, printing structures out of skeletal cells. Uh, another, all these biomimicry people uh, do images of those things, but actually not working with them. Right. And then a, a, a three hundred thousand dollar hamburger comes out. Uh, what's his name? Andreas Frock. And then there is uh, eventually a company called Modern Meadows, which is right next to us um, in the Brooklyn Navy Yard in our space. You know, and they're 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 doing this stuff. Of what costs us three thousand dollars for a centimeter? They've got that cost way down because they're working at the bulk level. Mm -hmm. and, and they they're now geez what are they eight ten years in to that uh, that's all they do is improve the production of essentially uh printing immortal cell lines it's just not for me on any level and they've had some degree of success i mean they created a uh, a printed uh a shirt that came from a printed meat that's combined with cotton and so it's like a a victimless leather and cotton uh, mix biopolymer yeah amazing yeah, that, so that i just for me to do that would be just every single day working on that one thing and that's uh you know that, that's not the job of that's not what it, it's not a bad thing to do it's just don't have the bandwidth or the capacity i've since uh, gone on to we now patent all our ideas i was gonna say oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no, we, we patented, we patent and patent and patent. And then, uh, we have looked more recently, uh, this is the most recent patent on something that, you know, I could stand behind and, and just run it as a company, but it, it's, um, you know, it's a, it's a different, it's a different animal altogether. So I, you know, I don't, you, you know, I'm thinking of, um, the one laptop per child program out of MIT mm -hmm. and that just took you know, all, um, a number of faculty members, their entire, you know, the next 10 years of their lives were producing that one thing. And that just, you know, um, I'm forgetting the name of Nicholas Negroponte was the, the leader of that effort. And it just took years and it, it came out and worked and did everything they had promised. It just, it wasn't under a hundred dollars. I think it was selling for $129 and people saw that as a failure. Mm -hmm. The car that we had done uh, under Bill Mitchell at MIT, that was my uh, part of my doctoral research. We produced a city car, uh, eventually it became the Heroku vehicle and we manufactured it. Um, and that was Will Lark and others. And Ryan went off to make an autonomous vehicle company. It's just you know, 10 years later, uh, you get this thing and it's it, it works, proves the theory and is out there. It just, you know, it wasn't exactly the right time. Yeah. So they've got 10 years of their lives in a, in a vehicle that's, you know, no, no longer, it's no longer made or manufactured. It's didn't sell well and is, you know, just this one clear paradigm shift of change, but it didn't take off. And you've now, what do you do? Cause you've got 10 years of just making this one little device or one car, mm -hmm. I guess in this case. Yeah. So not, not that I'm afraid to do it. I shouldn't say, or can't applaud that effort of work. It's just that there's probably hundreds and hundreds of, of things that go from a napkin sketch to a full on productized uh, thing that you could purchase at scale and goes nowhere as yeah. a business. Yeah. And maybe on that note, I'll just end on this one on this question. Uh, we have the, the we had some experts outside consultants come in and, and talk to Terraform about what it is that we can do and how to improve our our financials and and uh, there is one very grumpy guy. Uh, they, these were all business experts, uh, mm -hmm. the finest in the field. They came out of the, the Harvard Business School. They have a club in New York City, and he goes, Mitch, listen, 
your ideas of invention, changing the world, everything that you've ever done, and anything that anyone's ever done about changing the world and invention is somewhere down like here. And up here, like way up here, is something called the market. <laughs> and if you don't understand what market is, right. and and if there is one, there's no point to all of those world changing inventions. So the one thing you need to take away from me is this. And he repeated the word market like 10 times, almost <laughs> screaming it at me. And it's just, he's right. Like you have to know what the market is. So, so yeah, you make the world's greatest urban car. It's a city car. It's amazing. It's omnidirectional, stands up. It's has all kinds of, uh, you know, robotic wheels and and wireless driving features and it's just world changing no one cares there's no market zero market yeah so yeah i you know and market is if you've ever watched an episode of shark tank this is my favorite tv show that is uh that lets you know about invention to market right so yeah. it's, so and that's often the case it's usually something ridiculous like a new type of peanut butter is going to sell the most right. for, uh, <laughs> a sock that's yeah, like, yeah. That's, <laughs> that stays on your foot has, yeah, that, that, yeah that has pictures of unicorns on it that's going to sell incredibly yeah but the guy who you know came up with the new wind turbine no no one wants that <laughs> it might also be like you said like a, a timing thing yeah. like you know we actually had this conversation with a, a designer who designed faucets you know like the smallest thing plumbing right faucets. plumbing faucets and um it, it feels like sometimes maybe the innovation is way too ahead of the curve that the general public isn't really prepared for it mm. or even thinking about it. And it's kind of disappointing and annoying, I'm sure, because like we have but, this new thing, you know, like we could change faster than we are and, you know, people are not ready for it. You, you have to see this documentary called General Magic. There's the most important company in Silicon Valley. It no longer exists. It is the most important moment in American invention in this last century, by far. And it, they invented a completely fully functional operating smartphone, basically in the late 70s. What? And then they started showing people what it is. And people said things like, I don't have email and I don't want it. And then other people going, why would I want all my music in that little box? <laughs> and other people going like, well, my phone is attached to the wall. <laughs> you know, That's a good point. That's a good point. They, they just, it wasn't yeah. ready. And these yeah. were the brightest minds out of Apple, Sony, AT&T, Verizon. These were the best people in computing and electronics imaginable. And they had a vision that everyone wanted. And then it took 15 years later, maybe a little bit more, and you had Steve Jobs selling the exact same thing. Yeah. And it, that's, so yeah. And that's lucky, by the way, yeah. that it was only that amount of time. But they <laughs> all watched their invention just promoted and by a totally different company, the same idea. And of course, he did it in a way that was incremental. He, uh, you know, showed it was first the iPod. It was a thing to play your music. Mm -hmm. And then it, he let the public think, like, wouldn't it be great if it, I could stick my <laughs> flip phone onto this? You know, and if, of course he thought that. Yeah. But he had a sort of slowly, like a drug dealer, feed yeah, you yeah, a yeah. little bit, get you addicted, and then build it up. And that's only in telecommunications. That is not architecture. Architecture takes 40 years to change. I mean, it's just no, you could show someone the most um, amazing new improvement in, I don't know, a facade system. It's just not going to change. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, phones are a lot quicker to change than architecture. Cars are quicker to change than architecture, but they're still takes a long time. We've, we've had electric cars for, you know, I guess half a century. Well, no, the first car was electric, uh, or at least Edison did one. So it's, you know, it just still hasn't taken hold. Finally, now Tesla has done that, I, I would say, at scale. So, so you can make these like these one of a kind, brilliant leapfrogging technological changes or fixes, but they don't necessarily take hold at scale. So I, I don't know if I found anything like that in my life that I'm, I'm going to do just that. And I guarantee you, if I did, if I knew something that was all about market and it was so simple to do, I would immediately go for it. But, mm -hmm. but no one can make that prediction. Yeah. No, it's impossible. Um, 
I was wondering with the 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 model of your practice. So, if you ever get people approaching you and they want you, you do patent ideas, but they want to use you as the as the intellectual property, and they say, "Hey, we'll give you like royalties or percentage or something. Let us run with this thing and make it real. And that way, you guys can get funding to do other things, keep doing what you're doing, you know, and not have to <clears throat> go through production and whatnot." Oh uh, yes, yes, that happens and has happened and still happens hmm. but it's a it's a gray area um you know we worked with mycelium which is uh it's like it's a mushroom it's a root base of a mushroom it's the dendritic structure of uh the root base of any mushroom and it, it can be petrified and creates all kinds of phenomenal usable shapes it can replace styrofoam and, and that was something we had been working with very very early on and plan to do just that. Let many others, you know, to take it on, manufacture it, and and use it in ways they wanted to. It just it gets very very sticky because mm -hmm. other people are also doing. Phil Ross was doing that. He's arguably uh, uh, um, he didn't have the patent at the time, but he had uh, published it first. So he had something called Prior Art right. was his, and then Ecovative. Uh, they came snuck in with their own patent, and then they had stakeholders involved, and then. There was an argument between who really owned that and we were doing it as R and D and it just, no one was doing it. You know, this is like 12 years ago back then, but it, now everyone's doing it. It's really hard to, to grab something and control it for all of that time. And here's the thing. You need all of that synergy. You need all of those other groups making benches or lights or a, you know, a new type of, uh, you know, thing to hold us whatever uh, to replace styrofoam or put in as, as insulation or acoustic tiles you need know, all of those creative people and companies and minds working together to even get people to be remotely interested in a mushroom based product right i mean it, it's pervasive through all design fields i mean i'm sure the guy who was designing a faucet might have looked at can i do this out of mushroom and realized nah, i can't but it's out there uh, and it's by no means commonplace hmm. so that's again the yeah. market question. Yeah. So uh, you know we we are fine, actually, being in the midst of those cultures where it's synergy, sharing, competing, challenging, pushing the boundary with others, whether it's a material or a system or an idea for a city. We like being in that that um, that soup, that mix, and contributing one aspect to it. I think that's fair to say. That's that's a great. Uh, way to work. It's very, very healthy. Mm -hmm. so, so, so you're not claiming I've invented all of rap music. You just, you get to a niche where there's many others doing that type, that, that kind of genre, and it builds up everyone together. Right. Um, I think that's important. Otherwise you'd never get to a new type of music as an example, mm -hmm. or material use or design paradigm. Mm -hmm. Um, a question about funding, because uh, this question has, has come up. Uh, actually, I know our listeners are interested to hear your answer. For a research-based practice, um, if you guys define yourself that way, how do you support yourself financially? Is it through grants? Is it through, you know, I can't imagine it's by winning, you know, maybe $20,000 through a random competition. It doesn't seem very sustainable. Right. right. Uh, we do random competitions. I'd say it's, it's we average about 11 a year and we'll win oh. one a year. Wow. And, and they pay almost nothing. Yeah. So uh, it's usually, it's not for the money. Uh, we get commissions. We get grants. Uh, we have private clients. We, I mean, we, we have sponsors. Uh, oh. We've got... Uh, almost every source of financing imaginable. We we actually do workshops and consulting. We've created our own school called the One Lab. So we, we get actual tuition. <laughs> uh, we, we, we've, we've been very savvy in uh, figuring out ways to to make um, to make some money to, to allow us to do the research that we do. That was done in part because I realized that after 13 years of school, two master degrees and a PhD, <laughs> I never took a class in business and I didn't, didn't realize that every part of my life was in professional practice was all about business. Um, so, I mean, there was one half course that you have to take professional practice and it just, I was so interested in studio. I didn't 
pay attention to it. And the guy is still teaching it, which is great. And, and everything he said has was so important. I just didn't know it at the time. <laughs> yeah. But we we I uh, stepped down from running the company as the CEO and executive director uh, to finding someone who uh, has an MBA and is an expert in business, and they work very hard as our you know our leader to uh, figure out the financing of, the, of, the, of everything we do. So we'll get commissions from museums and galleries. We will apply for grants. I just told you we, we applied to the uh, State Department for the US Biennale. That's a $375,000 grant. We'll get um, sponsorship. We'll get money from uh, uh, big corporates uh, mm. for their marketing campaigns like BASF or Intel. And, List goes on, and then we'll have private clients. Uh, we'll get we'll get funding from academic uh, institutions. NYU has been very helpful as a professor there, so I get a, a certain amount of research funding every year, and and I collaborate with other faculty to increase that. So it's there's a lot of sources of, uh, of funding we go for. It's just you got to realize that fifty percent of what we do is chasing the money. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So. So we have business development as half our team. So we've got all these inventors, scientists, architects, thinkers, dreamers, and then the half, the rest of us are business development. And that is, um, that's something actually I learned in part from, uh, Bjarke, Bjarke Ingels, Mm -hmm. where majority of his office was business development. So you could find architects anywhere and they're nowhere near as expensive as the business development people. And they're the ones that grab hold of a client, bring them into the fold and go to the next client and the next client from that one source. And that's, that is a, that is a skill. It's a profession and that's something you need on board. We're in 501 C3 nonprofit. So we're different. We don't have the same sort sort of incentives and, you know, it's a totally different culture. But that doesn't mean that the the financing isn't as important. So so there's a massive amount of effort doing that. And Vivian Kwan is our executive director, and she went to the Wharton Business School, which is where Donald Trump went to. Totally different culture than uh, you know than my world of design. Mm-hmm. But it's but it's super useful, uh, and you know that's why she's uh, you know she's our uh, executive director. So a couple of questions: How many people are at Terraform One? And then the second is um, these de- de- business development uh, folks. So literally, that's their their job is just to get business and and basically you you the the designers and the creatives and the scientists and whoever else kind of tell them about X projects and they learn that and they go out and they pitch it and they like yeah. that's pretty crazy. I, mean, I don't think I think a lot of people would assume that the really the ratio might be ninety ten or a hundred percent creatives and those folks and you just you know business comes or I don't know. I don't know what they assume. Yeah. Well, okay. So, so, uh, right now we're about, uh, it's like 12 or 13, like core staff. And then we, we have a, a board that is double that amount and then advisory board. That's also extends much larger. Uh, oh. we've, we've been as small as five and we've been as big as 40 staff members depending on what the project is. <laughs> so we, we go through uh, starve and feed cycles, like most architecture firms. Uh, oh, we're not an architecture firm, but re- the creative research uh, group. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, that's, that's, a, that, that, that's for a whole host of reasons. Uh, some projects, um, well, okay, so the business development folks uh, you know, there, there, there are places to find projects, whether it's RFQs or RFPs or, uh, uh, you know, national listings or, uh, you know, public art spa- calls for public art. Like there, there is a number of places and certainly the grant environment. I mean, our, our grant environment is also under uh, BD. So that is a part of it. So they, there's, they have many different skills and perspectives on how they approach it. And and that's what they do. It's also the follow up and the um, <coughs> sorry, the the personal relationships. So business development is you're not asking for a job. You're becoming friends with people that are in a, adjacent to things that um, 
we might need or be able to pro provide a service for them. Uh, so, so the business development people also, uh, they create relationships. So they're going to go out and have drinks with someone in government or have drinks with someone that's related to a company that has a big marketing campaign where they want to do sustainable projects or they're, they're going to find someone that's uh, looking at a new technology in different ways to you know deploy it and how it might fit into something in architecture facades or structure who knows and so that that's what they do is they have those kinds of friendships and uh, you know they, they maintain them and so as things come along those are the phone calls that uh, are traded and gives us kind of a foot in the door and it's it's a very soft mm -hmm. it's a nudge like approach it's just gently nudging people but not really there for any specific goal and so business development is you do that full time you're constantly moving in those circles going to those parties talking about their kids meeting others and then uh, architects do do that too it's usually one person the principal of the firm who's out there doing it like Moshe Softy I shouldn't say that <laughs> but, <laughs> but Moshe, part of what he does is he hobnobs. He's out there, of course, meeting people, and that's he's in that community, and then he brings in the clients. <clears throat> Sorry, um, <laughs> I'm glad I'm coughing at that point because uh, actually Moshe is great. So, but it makes a lot of sense. I mean, like even for large offices, I think there's this idea a lot of amongst a lot of diehard creatives or architects specifically you could say where they're just interested in the in the <clears throat> in the creative portion of making a building and that's fine and, and i understand that but they don't realize it's something that you don't really get maybe unless you have your own practice like we have interviewed what, the former ceo of hok well one of the three founders one of was it the h or the o it was the h or the k i forget his sole job was business development one third of the founding partners was business development it's an it's a necessity at some point that's every one of those three letter firms. I mean, yeah. you know, Merrill in SOM without Merrill, there's no S or O. There's <laughs> no way it would have worked. Uh, every single one of those, like, there's always the one person that's the business manager or it's um, a partnership that's slightly hidden. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, Jim Glimpf uh, was Frank Gehry's number one business guy. And uh, he was born out of I.M. Pei's office. So that's where he learned how to do the work. And he was the best guy in the field. And Frank had a Pritzker and had double the money that Pei Cobb Fried was producing. And they just got him. And Jim Glimpf transformed Gary. He brought in Katia. He had the Barcelona, uh, the fish pavilion done for the Olympics. It was actually a big loss, but actually changed, changed architecture. Because I mean, he brought in probably, you know, with Dassault Systems, the most amazing software, and then went even further to make it into Gary Technologies to actually change the software and make it a, an architectural product. So it wasn't made for airplanes or the aerospace industry. It was actually now more useful for architects. And, and that's all he did. He did everything. Hmm. Uh, but he had the Jesus factor, <laughs> which is like Gary. So he would do everything you need, the nuts and bolts, the construction, the management, the economics, everything about the, the, the getting these buildings done. And then, you know, the, the Jesus factor, or maybe the X factor is a better thing to say. <laughs> but that would be Frank and his design vision. Right. Right. And then uh, I don't know why I just did like a Trump thing. But it's just sort of like, <laughs> but it's just like but you can see he, he was the business guy. Yeah. And, and, you know, he's just and then any, you know, any when there was a gray area, he would just attribute it to Frank's, you know, creative side. And that, yeah. that's pushed through the Bill Bow. Mm -hmm. the Walt Disney Concert Hall. This was done because of the relationship with the business partner. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, you know, uh, Sheila at, at Bjarke's office, I, you know, I love Sheila. If she just for, quit one day, I would do everything possible to have her join our team. <laughs> because that's, she is, she's made an empire. Obviously it's under Bjarke's, his personality and his, you know, his charm, charisma, whatever. He's brilliant at that. And, you know, his design vision, uh, you know, it's at such an enormous scale, but it's the business people behind him are wicked. And his CEO <laughs> is a female and got her chops, I think, at Lego. And then I think also McKinsey, I have to be oh, sure about okay. that. But anyway, that's, so, you know, he's got real business people 
doing that. So he can come in and, and make some claim about, I'm going to design a master planet. And then, you know, <laughs> some people are like, what? And then actually treat it very seriously because the army of partners he has behind him and their focus on business is, is damn good. So he provides that X factor, that vision, and then these people actually get to work on, is there a market for it? And let's finance it. And that's how, you know, he'll, he'll meet, um, well, I've met the same people, but how they, they've recently given him a city, yet another city, not the one in the Toyota one, but uh, the one here in Arizona with uh, Bill Gates to build from scratch. <laughs> that, that was, that was Mark Lore. Mark Lore is uh, uh, CEO of, um, uh, oh, I'm forgetting right now. But anyway, he came to Terraform first. And mm-hmm. just, you know, it's like, you build me a city from scratch. No. <laughs> <laughs> great guy. He's a great guy, but you know, just have to be honest. I think that's great, though. I think I think a lot of people will, or I know they're very interested to hear that side of, of this conversation. Um, pivoting real quick, because I know we're actually we're burning through the two hours crazy fast. Um, I did have a question. <laughs> it's a big question to ask with a few minutes left. Um, what is what are the ways that current cities so like man like manhattan or new york and new york city in general uh specifically what are the ways that they can be transformed so that they are you know ultra sustainable let's say completely self-sufficient and more socially equitable because I, I know you guys have done a lot of work in this kind of space but um i think maybe for a lot of folks it seems like such a future state it's a dream it's a sci-fi novel it's too far away to kind of imagine um but i i feel like with the work you guys do there you must have in your mind some more you know realistically scientifically proven like things that could happen to get us to that point uh to think of a, a socially you know, to change the societal structure of an urban area like in america is that what you're saying not just the the physical thing but the actual transformation of uh I guess part of our civilization is that what you're talking about? Yeah, I, I, yeah, in, in the in the broadest broadest sense. I mean, I, I guess uh, a way to dial it in would be. Uh, well, I guess I was tight. There's two questions with it. There's the the more of the um, ecological side of it, like how do you make a city mm-hmm. self-sustaining and green as a word, um, and then also in that future, have it be a place where it's more socially. Um, ex- it accepts more different uh, types of people, diversity and economic diversity too. Mm. They're kind of different mm. things, perhaps, but I don't know. Yeah, they're, they're sure they're different yet related. Um, well, let me talk about the catalyst to get us there. Sure. And uh, this is, you know, I've got many thoughts on that, but one version is that you know, we actually need a real crisis hmm. uh, because there there are libraries. There's just. I mean, enormous amounts of information and engineering projects and designs of possible futures that, you know, that fill up all kinds of, of books, some way more pragmatic than others, but there's all kinds of answers to how to deal with energy in the future. Some of the most amazing inventions and some very practical ones. There's all kinds of answers on how to deal with uh, distribution of food, how to deal with uh, waste, you know, new ways of, of uh, creating infrastructure and moving around cities. Like it's just enormous solutions. Uh, and they, they've been around for you know, decades. So it's, it's, not, it's not even new. Hmm. Uh, so it's just a matter of what is the incentive, what's the catalyst to actually get those things to happen, you know, or, or just any one of them. And part of that, you know, there, there's many theories. Part of that, though, is going to be the crisis is, is the one, one theory, which is something so big and horrific that people just have no choice but to stop doing the bad and go to the good. Uh, so this is like with fossil fuels. That's a big part of the equation. I mean, it just seems like any reasonable person understands that they're just not good for the atmosphere. And they're just not good for a whole host of other reasons too, social and cultural. I mean, it's, they're mostly coming from other places. Uh, you know, it's, it's a security or military issue. It's a transportation issue. Um, it's, a, it's an issue of, of in some cases, uh, human rights. I mean, you're just, 
even what's happening with Ukraine and Russia, the fact that we have any reliance on Russian oil mm -hmm. is pretty offensive. So, but we need large scale change and a big enough crisis for us to absolutely get us off that addiction, to, to just turn the system to another way. There's been very few examples of that in history. Uh, I often point out to something that Paul Gilding discusses. He was the former CEO of Greenpeace. He talks about a Pearl Harbor moment, which is um, it's very, very bad what happened to Japanese Americans. So that's something we don't want to repeat. But what d the good part about Pearl Harbor is that we became unified in getting into the war effort, fighting the Nazis, and in this case, uh, the Japanese. And we were unified, no longer arguing, no longer isolationists, mm. but we retooled the American economy. Within a matter of a m month or two, we started almost immediately. And very fast, we were making planes and tanks and military equipment to, as, as one sort of, uh, what's it, Clausewitz, or Clausewitz, the total war uh, scenario where everyone in the civilization is working towards a common goal. Mm -hmm. and in this case, it was war. You, you're either in the war effort or leave the country. And, and, and uh, that was uh, you know, a moment where we saw massive change. Our whole civilization just shifted. That would happen with climate change when we see something that horrific affect us. Something that's just so big and scary, the, the sort of enemy at the gates that we will transform major systems in our economy and do it rather quickly uh and and you know it could happen unfortunately it might be too late mm. uh, there is a great and you have to look at science fiction and there's all kinds of scenarios from the united nations but and many other places but there's a, a more recent book by kim stanley robinson uh, called ministry for the future which i absolutely love and it, it's about that Pearl Harbor moment, but it's a it's a crisis in the environment that the globe can see, and it becomes the beginning of a catalyst for change to stop doing these kind of polluting things that we've been doing for so long, and, and it, it it actually starts in India, where people um, uh, they die from extreme heat, so it's a massive heat wave. The lakes boil, people just families die. Thirty million people disappear in less than two weeks in the most horrific way, you know, in, in 5K resolution from cell phones and everywhere else, they just couldn't even escape. And this is somewhere 20 years in the future. Mm. So it's not that far away. And then the, it plays out the scenario of what, what would happen to the rest of the world's economies? How would we, how would we respond and react uh, uh, to something like that? And it actually is actually pretty true will say it's well it's a it's a regional issue mm. it's not a global one right? we're mm. very sorry for those people in india but anyone near the equator it's your issue it's you know if we're in canada or the further north it's, we don't have to worry about that or if you're in argentina like this is just not going to affect us so once again we fail as a civilization to get to civilization 2.0 and they still go about business as usual yep. using the same fossil fuels and the same systems as before with a little bit more impetus for change but but not enough so the the book goes on to then then it gets into science fiction which is the united nations has a group called ministry of the future and they form a splinter group of basically black ops people that go and assassinate <laughs> CEOs of petrochemical companies. Here we go. That's the solution. <laughs> so, so, so eco-terrorism or just flat out, you know, like maybe that's a, an answer. Uh, I, also, <laughs> I, I also think that if it's not a crisis, it will be leapfrogging technologies. Okay. So that's the, that's the dark answer. And the, the positive answer is, you know, invent something that is just so magnificent it, it's amazing for the environment, but it's just such a game-changing technology. Everyone wants one, and it's cheap, mm -hmm. at least cheaper than whatever else was out there. And that's when people adopt it like that. And, it, and I, probably if you say it's good for the environment, no one's going to be interested. That, I, I would say, is more or less like a magnified Tesla effect. Sure. Because they, they, they just sold you the electric car, but instead of mm -hmm. a Prius, they sold you the sports version. And, right. and it was and the cost and the luxury, mm -hmm. everything else. And they never even sold it, right? They never had a commercial for a Tesla. 
So it's it's a kind of a brilliant direction, and and Elon still is like he's still succeeding at this. So so I think it's either do something really fantastic that nails it to where there's almost no choice. Like the idea I would use a landline over a smartphone is absurd, and it just happens to be good for the environment. These are not there yet, but we could do it. Or a giant crisis, and, and there's more scenarios. It's not that um, not that simple. Sure, sure, that's fantastic. Um, uh, uh, this was. For, oh, you have another question. I have one last question. Okay. Uh, how long did you have your dreadlocks for? <laughs> yeah, and that's why the most important did question. you get rid of them? Yeah. I had my dreads for. Uh, well, they're called locks technically. So dread dreadlock is is um is a different. It's not a is a different term. Um, I had them for Jesus twenty something years. Oh boy! And uh, yeah, they, I had to cut them a lot, and uh, you know they were down to my ass, and it was just <laughs> crazy. Uh, but uh, you know, it's, uh, just to maintain them. But uh, I cut them completely off. I shaved everything uh, on the night that Trump got elected. So um, huh. it was there in 2016, and I had promised my daughters that we would have a woman in charge of this country. It seemed like there was no way Hillary was going to lose. Mm. Every indicator right. was saying that she was. In a, I wasn't, you know, a big fan of Hillary, yeah, yeah, yeah. but it just was, you know. I promised my kids, you know, women could be leaders of the free world and should be, and uh, we were in shock. Not only was it that she didn't become the next president, but the worst guy imaginable in my mind became president. I, I valued nothing about, I mean, he was fine on TV, you know, but the idea that he was going to take that office was so disturbing. So at three in the morning, uh, my kids and I, we cut daddy's hair and uh, <laughs> I was on this like rampage for four years to get that guy out of office. Yeah. And that's, that's why I'm sort of upset at architects in Russia. Like, uh, you know, if you didn't like, I guess it's a different culture, but you know, if you didn't like the guy, you got to work hard to create change, yeah. wh whatever way you can. And if you don't say something or do something, then you're, you're complacent. You know, si silence is death. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now look what's happened. And uh, so, you know, they've had him reign for 20 years or more. So I, I didn't want that guy to lead this country. I didn't believe in many of the things he said. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's how that's that story. And that's exactly how it went down. So well, that's great. Three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> yeah. Buzz it right off. Yeah. Um, well, everyone was crying. I mean, it was the, like yeah. the Jacob Javits Center, people were just distraught. It was, oh, uh, I remember we were in New York and the morning after in the subway, it was, it was dead quiet. It was like, it was the weirdest thing ever in the streets everywhere. Like, like someone died. It was like, somber. It, it, it was, it was strange. Yeah. It, yes. Yeah. And then when Biden, I was just talking this morning to someone about do you watch the news or not and i remember like the greatest moments i've ever had watching the news was when i didn't watch the news <laughs> and I, I remember when uh biden got elected i didn't find out on the news i was in the lower east side and i heard trumpets and i was like wow like he's president like we did it yeah just changed like it's amazing i didn't have to you know i looked at the new york times later but i, I was like that's you could feel it in the streets. Like yeah, there yeah. was just people cheering and, and, and there was a big party for like a bunch of days. I remember drinking champagne in uh, <laughs> Washington Square with my students and <laughs> other professors were like, yes, through the pandemic, you know? Um, so yeah, yeah. So it, it's, it's been, it's been rough, right? In this country. And, and now we're going into World War Three, maybe, <laughs> hopefully not. Yeah. It's but, crazy, um, crazy times. Yeah. Well, on a more positive note, <laughs> <laughs> no, Biden being president is positive. Yeah, yeah that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, this was phenomenal. Um, we'd love to have you on the show again at, at some point in the future. Um, I've really enjoyed this conversation. I had a whole list of questions. We got through like two of them, <laughs> as I kind of expected because Great. you know you're you. Um, thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you for watching this on YouTube. If you like what we're doing, then please support the show by hitting that subscribe button and liking the episode and leaving comments and check out a lot more. You can find us on all the social medias. Follow us there. And of course, we have a website, which is secondstudiopod.com. Thanks, guys, and we'll see you on here soon. Bye-bye.